Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Adam. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. And today we're going to be talking about how to write your, your resume to make it uh, remote friendly. Um, this is going to be an updated talk of one that I gave a couple of years ago, which was just basically touching on best practices for developers when writing CVs. And given the current situation, it made sense to update that talk and then just kind of like go through um, all the tips and tricks you can use to make a CV, um, you know, as remote friendly as possible when you know that um, whoever is going to be reading it is, is going to be having that first um, contact with who you are by looking at your profile. So let's get into it. Cool. All right. Um, so, um, like I said, um, you know, I'm a PM at Microsoft right now. Before, I was a principal engineer at Andela. And then before that, I worked as a consultant at ThoughtWorks. Um, during my career, I've screened a lot of resumes myself. I've hired a lot of people, interviewed a lot of people. Um, I led engineering routine for quite a number of high profile companies. Um, and then myself, I applied successfully and failed um, to a few um, top tier companies. So I've seen quite a lot when it comes to resumes. Um, and this is why um, some of these um, tips um, have been able to come to life. So why should you care? <clears throat> um, COVID-19 is forcing a lot of, um, you know, pretty much everybody to stay home and work remotely, right? Um, and it's going to be like this for a while. Um, just today, I was reading the news and then Twitter has announced that um, they are making everybody work, that they are going to allow everybody to work from home permanently. And so this means that there's going to be a big shift in how uh, you know, like people think about recruiting and hiring and, you know, all these kind of things. Um, for those who are just finishing school or who are, you know, are going to finish school in a year, um, campus recruitment is a pretty big way for many people to get their first jobs. And so now that, you know, this situation is in place, uh, you know, campus recruitment probably for this year is going to be cancelled. Uh, we don't know what's going to be like next year. Um, so it's, you know, so the, the only way you get to um, um, connect with a, with a company you want, you want to work for is most likely going to be by you sending out your, your resume. Um, and now that this situation is in place, that also means that most tech companies um, that were never set up to be remote friendly or remote first in the first place are going to be moving all of their recruiting activities online. Right, so um, think of it this way as um, maybe there is some campus recruitment that's happening for 30% of the time, then there is the regular online channel for maybe another 30%, and then there is referrals for 40%. Um, but now everything is going to move online. So the only way you, you get to um, apply to a company is either by a referral from an internal person or by applying directly. So that means that the volume of um, um, applications that are going to be coming through online channels is going to be a lot more compared to before. And then the last thing is that you have 10 seconds to make a good impression. We're going to talk about this um, in a couple of slides um, and forward. So the first thing that you need to think about when you're writing a resume is who is really looking at it, right? And this is one mistake that I see people make all the time is developers will typically write their resume with all the technical jargons in there, assuming that whoever is going to be reading it is going to be a technical person. Um, sometimes that's true, but then in my experience, you could also have situations where depending on the company that you're applying for, the very first person who reads your resume may not necessarily be like a highly tech savvy person, or right? it could be a recruiter, an HR professional, a non-technical founder, the list goes on and on, right? So it's not just about trying to make your, your, your resume as technical as possible to look like super smart or know what you're talking about. <clears throat> but it's really about making it accessible to pretty much anyone regardless of whether they're technical or not. So what do they look for when they you know, pick up your resume? In one word, they're looking for competence, right? They want to make sure that um, you, know, you actually have the skills to get the job done. And everybody is going to judge a resume differently depending on what their background is. Um, so, and, and, and competence can be translated in different ways, right? It could be you know, I went to a great school that is known for having a strong computer science education. I work at X company, and this company is known to be, you know, like have, have a strong engineering team. 
I have some great personal projects. I've done other things. Like all these things are basically like at the end of the day, how somebody who is reading your resume is going to look at it and be like, okay, I think this person is probably um, a good fit for this job. So let's speak to them and then find out, you know, um, more, right? And again, like you, when I say you have 10 seconds to make a good impression, like you think about it like an elevator pitch, right? Um, which is a, 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 a common concept for um, you know entrepreneurs looking to pitch their ideas to investors like you know between when you get into the elevator and then it goes all the way to the last floor you have maybe 10 to 50 maybe like a minute to be able to you know, like make your pitch the same concepts right um when a recruiter is going to receive so many applications and they have to sift through all of them to kind of like shortlist um, those that they want to contact is the same thing you know like tell yourself it's going to be 10 seconds exactly I need to be very careful about the way I present myself. Um, otherwise, you know, it's gone forever, right? So let's talk about some best practices. Um, first one is your resume should fit on one page. Um, this, is the, this is the debate that we've had over and over again. I still maintain that it's very important that you keep your resume fit, fitting on one page. Um, and the way I think about it is um, one mistake that I see many people make is uh, we always want to you know, kind of like do this thing where, um, you know, the longer it is or the more content rich it looks, then the better, but that's not necessarily true. Um, there is no guarantee that whoever is going to read your CV is going to read beyond the first page. And, and the way I like to think about this is, you know, like when was the last time you did, like, let's say, like, you know, did Google something on, search for something on Google, and then you got, you went beyond the first page. Like you have to be really desperate. Uh, most likely the very first page will have the most relevant results that you're looking for on Google. And so I, it's the same thing for, it's, it's kind of like a, a pattern that we've learned, right? So whenever you're reading a document or you're reading anything that you open, you pay attention to the first page and it's what is on the first page that captivates you to actually want to go on the second page, right? So you can have the guarantee that, you know, like whatever you're putting out there is going to be, um, you know, like whoever is going to read is going to go beyond the first page. So always try to fit it on one page so that, you know, at a single glance, whoever is reading this can see everything that they need to know. Um, and then they can make a decision about you, right? So you can think about your resume as a summary. It doesn't have to be, you know, like all the details in there is like a very high level summary of everything you've accomplished. And don't be scared to reduce font sizes and margins. Like, you know, like I've reviewed CVs and uh, resumes and people would say, oh, um, I can't make it fit on one page. And then when you read it, you realize that it's because they're using like, you know, big fonts and, you know, like a lot of margins in place and all that. But again, if we are moving to a world where everything is being done online, your resume is going to be read on the computer and is going to have, uh, you know, like the person is going to be able to like zoom in to see exactly what they have to look for and stuff. So you don't have to worry very much about, you know, like um, your formatting being too small or too big because zooming can be can make it pretty much you know as big as it used to be for whoever needs to read it. So let's talk about hyperlinks. Um, so I I recommend that you hyperlink everything on your on your, on your resume, right? Um, if you're going to keep it on one page, that means that your your resume becomes the central, I guess, source that would take you to pretty much every other page or every other relevant content out there. So the first reason why you want to do this is because um, some companies use applicant tracking systems to screen resumes. And they do that because they may receive a lot of applications and they want to have some sort of system in place to you know, go through these profiles before like an actual human being looks at it. The challenge is that um, they have ranking algorithms in place. So let's say that I work at I work at Microsoft and then I am a community admin for you know a community back home called Dev Congress, right? So because I work at Microsoft and then my, my, my resume has, you know, community admin at Dev Congress, if I apply to Microsoft and then I get this job, um, Dev Congress link is going to be ranked in some system somewhere as, okay, like, you know, we've, we've hired somebody who is, you know, a member of this community before. So we're going to assign some weight to anybody who is also an admin of this community. So if any other admin tries to apply, um, just because I applied initially and then they, they, they hired me and then they considered my community experience, um, you know, the, the next person from the community who also applies is going to have some weight points. So think about it from 
you know, companies you've worked at and, you know, schools you've gone to and all those things. Um, and the way it works is, is looking at the, the links that you, you've added to your profile and then making the decisions based on that, right? Not the actual name. It's like it has to be like a link. Um, so I've seen a couple of systems work this way. So that's why I always say, look, we um, um, hyperlink everything because you don't know in which application tracking system your resume is going to end up. And you don't want to hurt yourself by not hyperlinking, you know, like stuff that's really important that, you know, may, may have some relevance to the company you're applying for. Um, second thing is you can think about your resume as a profile page, just like a Facebook page or whatever, right? Um, it's, it has to link to, to, to things so that when, when people see something that they may not necessarily know much about, but they are curious, they could click on it and then it takes them to a page where they can read more about it. So if I don't know about a company that you worked at, and the company seems to be doing something interesting, um, I should be able to click on the link and then go and read more about the company and see, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. So if you did, if you worked at this company, then that must be really interesting. Um, you know, so things that you can hyperlink are like schools you attended, companies you work for, projects you've done, um, if available publicly, email address, personal websites, community you volunteer for. You can even add hackathons, uh, you know, like, uh, blog posts that you've written, articles, etc. It's really up to you to, you know, figure out what is relevant to you and then add the appropriate hyperlinks in different places. All right, so um, the other thing that we, we need to be careful about is highlighting achievements, not job descriptions. So I've actually written um, some examples here. So in, in software engineering disciplines, right, job titles are fairly standard. Like when, when, you, when you call somebody a software engineer, let's say like one, or software development engineer, like some companies like to call it, um, it's going to be the same in, in pretty much every company. We know exactly what um, somebody at that level should be capable of. So simply listing your responsibilities or your duties at your job, you're just hurting yourself because you're not really telling the recruiter anything about what you're doing, right? So in this example that I'm putting here, um, I'm sure you've seen like things like this in, in, in profiles before, you know, developing high quality performance applications, translating feature, into requirement, feature requirements into code. These are things that are just basically descriptions. This is what you do on a daily basis. But then that doesn't really say anything about how successful you were at that job. So what you should do instead is think about the, the goals that you've achieved um, at, your, at your job, at your role. And I recommend that you know, people do this like at least once a year, like think through everything that you've done during the year and then kind of like list it down and it has to be something that is quantifiable, right? So saying, instead of saying, um, I've written you know, some software application for creating users, if you actually build something that saved the company money or time or you know, made your manager's life easy or it's, it's helping any way, like that's, that's a quantifiable result that you want to put down. So these are typical examples of things you can write, you know, re-architecture user resolution system to make it more performant, less buggy, resulting in a 50% increase. Um, QA library for um, helping the development team test features faster with high quality, you know, as long as it's quantifiable and then people can look at it and be like, oh, that's, that's interesting. I want to hear more about this particular thing that they did. Um, it piques the interest of, um, of, the, of the recruiter and then they would want to know more. And, if you look at the language I'm using as well, you realize that it doesn't have any sort of technical jargon in there. Because again, you want to be careful with how you write it because you don't know the person who is going to be reading is whether they are actually technical or not, right? Um, so showcase demos of your code. So this is, this is actually pretty new for me. Um, from the last time I gave this talk and I've reviewed a couple of, 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 um, of resumes, this is one thing that came up. Um, people would list out their personal projects or, you know, like stuff that they've worked on. And then they would just kind of like list it as a list of links that you click on. Um, normally that would be fine, but then there are two, there are two problems with, with this approach, right? The first one is that one, you don't know who is reading your, your resume. You don't know if they're technical or not. And you don't know whether, you know, by simply putting a list uh, of projects that you have on GitHub or you know, whatever, they're going to be able to say, oh, this is, this is actually great work, right? Um, secondly, um, when you when you when you when you do this, <clears throat> you also kind of hurt yourself a little bit because if your code is actually not that great, and the only thing that the person has to judge you your 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 abilities is looking at your code, um, it's also a little bit unfair, right? As opposed to 
um, being able to put down a little description of the project, then have a demo link, like a working demo link for that project, and then the code repo. Because, um, you know, like psychologically speaking, if I, if I look at, uh, you know, like a demo of a product and then the, the user interface or what I'm seeing visually is actually pretty interesting, before I even go and look at the code, like I already have this mental image of, wow, like that's actually a really good product, right? And then when I look at the code, even if the code is not great, I may still want to talk to the person to see if, okay, maybe they have written the code a long time ago, so they may have learned some new things now. Or um, the other thing is that companies could also be hiring for multiple positions, um, which is a fun fact because when I applied to Microsoft, I was actually applying for an engineering position, but, but they ended up saying, hey, like based on your experience, we think you'd be a great um, program manager, would you consider that? And I said, yeah, sure, I love learning new things, so why not? So that's another thing. So even though you, 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 you put up your projects there, always keep in mind that you, know, you, want to, you want to show that you are capable and you have the skill set to build working products. And a good way to do that is to make sure that you're, you're putting demos of your, your projects in there. Um, even if you don't have the best code, if you, if you actually build stuff that work and is pretty impressive, you would you would be able to at least like get a foot in the door right uh, before talking more about the code and stuff but if you just put the code there first of all only technical recruiters will understand what you're doing and then decide from there if it's you know if it's worth doing or not uh, and then secondly you kind of like close yourself up to you know possible opportunities that may be a better fit for you in, in that company um so summarizing your tech stack. So one other mistake that I see a lot of people make is when you write your, your, your resume, um, in the professional experience, you would, you would kind of like list out or you kind of like list your responsibilities and then like, you know, slide in the tech stacks of the languages and the frameworks you've used, you know, without like a coherent way of understanding exactly what your proficiency is, right? So in this example, you know, Senior engineer at Google, built web scraper in Python, deployed to Google Cloud. I read this, I'm thinking, okay, I mean, that means he knows a little bit of Python and he knows how to deploy to Google, Google Cloud. But I can't say for sure, um, you know, what's like, if that's really their core stack, right? Um, same thing for the other one, work on Android mobile app using Java, messaging features and comment. It doesn't really say anything about, you know, your proficiency level. Um, and many times, you know, it, it's, you leave it to the recruiters to kind of figure out based on what you've written, your professional experience, um, what they think you're, you know, you're, you're, you are most experienced in. And that may not necessarily be the case. Maybe you, you don't want to work in, a, you know, in, in that stack anymore because it was a long time ago, um, or you don't want to, um, or you don't have as much experience as it, it's, you know, the, the way you wrote it made it sound. So to avoid any sort of confusion, it's just better for you to summarize your stack somewhere. Uh, I typically recommend at the top of your, of, your, of your resume, maybe like right below your name or your you know, intro summary, whatever, just list exactly what you work with, right? Um, it's not really useful if you work with C++ 10 years ago and haven't done anything with it and then you put it in there. Um, it doesn't really help much. So it's, very, it's, it's better to kind of like, you know, like list out exactly what you, you, you work with that you're most proficient with. And so if, you know, even before you, you um, um, even right after you apply for the job, they read through and they're like, okay, we don't think that this stack is going to be good. Then you know that, yeah, like that was never going to be a good fit, right? Um, you shouldn't leave the, the guesswork to the recruiter to do, like be very explicit about what you do, like what, what you know um, really well. Um, so put your contact information in the footer, not in the header. So this is a UX hack um, that I actually learned myself, um, you know, not so long ago. So in a typical resume, you would usually see the name, you know, at the top, and then like contact information and you know some stuff out there. Um, but what I recommend that you do is to put your your contact information, your email address, your phone number, and any other way to reach you. Put it in the footer. The reason why you want to do that is because. Um, just think about how, um, you know, like terms and conditions pages are designed, right? You would never see a terms and condition page design and the accept button is at the top of the content. It's always at the bottom because they want to give you a chance to at least scroll through or glance through before you actually accept, right? Um, it's the same thing with, with this idea. Uh, some companies may actually be required to reach out to you even if you didn't get the 
you know, or you're not a good fit or give you feedback or whatever, right? And so you want to make sure that before they reach out to you, like they would have actually scrolled through your entire resume to find your contact information, your phone number or whatever it is. Um, that, that guarantees that if the recruiter didn't see something that they should know about you, then they would have seen it, right? That's, that's essentially the idea. Um, you want to make sure that, yeah, you know, they've seen it, um, they've seen everything before they're reaching out to me. Um, so it's a much better idea to put it in the footer. Um, have a website for your name. So this is like a bonus thing. It's not, you know, not everybody has to do it, but if you can, um, for, for search engine optimization purposes, it's good for you to have a website for your name. That just simply gives you some control over, you know, what shows up first, because um, if, you, if, you, if your domain name matches exactly how your name is, is pronounced, um, you would most likely end up being the first result on, you know, search engines. And that way, knowing that everybody is going to click on the very first thing, it gives you some control over how you want to present yourself, yourself publicly. Some, some recruiters would Google you just to see what comes up um, and all that. I want to make sure that, you know, like everywhere they, they find you, like, they, you know, they are seeing like the best version of yourself, right? Um, LinkedIn also works fine. It's fine to just have like a well-written LinkedIn profile that matches what is on your resume and goes into even more details. Um, you know, and that, that also achieves the same purpose. Um, a couple of things, I mean, like people ask me all the time, you know, okay, you said all these things, but I think everything on my resume is great. What, what do you think I should remove? And um, to be honest, if you are apply, if you, you know, if you are just getting started uh, as an, you know, uh, in, in the tech field, uh, high school is not relevant anymore. Um, you know, it's just better to have university or, you know, um, whatever latest, um, um, certifications you have as, as uh, on your on your resume, um, references are not really necessary uh, because again, remember that this is a this is a resume. So somebody is going to be um, reading this and then making a decision on you, and your references are not going to really be um, you know a big reason why they will say no to you, right? Um, hobbies are also not going to be really important at, at this stage um, for the same reasons. Like your hobbies are not going to really um, you know like make a big difference into whether somebody says yes or no. So these are things that I feel like if, if uh, you know, like a, a recruiter or a company wants to know more, then that's where they actually call you or when the actual, the actual interview process starts, then they get a chance to ask for these things, right? So don't have to necessarily be um, on, your, on, your, on your actual resume. Um, so yeah, so this is it. Uh, I, I mean, since this is being done live, I can't take questions live. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions, you know, review resumes, um, everything directly on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at uh, my handle, Adam Kumoji. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you.